Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's seminar. My name is uh, George Stefanopoulos, and I am the director of the Global Kaitegi Center. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you today, Professor Bavek Baxi, our seminar speaker. He is the Richard M. Morrow Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Ohio State University. He has also appointments in the Civil, Environmental, and Geodetic Engineering at Ohio State. And he's a visiting professor at the Indian Institutes of Technology in Bombay, Mumbai, and New Delhi. In his early career, the first 10 years of his academic career, his interests were in the area of process systems engineering. And uh, through modeling, simulation, optimization, artificial intelligence, he made significant advances in the area of complex and multi-scale systems, data analytics, and machine learning at various multiple scales. For the last 20 years, his interests have shifted to ecological issues and sustainability. His work is motivated by the need to have engineering methodologies which enhance the human well being, is societally acceptable, and respect the ecological limits. He collaborates with many people across many disciplines and uses methodologies from different areas, such as process systems engineering, systems ecology environmental economics, policy, applied statistics. As an academic, he has been very prolific. He has written the def a defining textbook two years ago that was published by Cambridge University Press titled Sustainable Engineering, colon, Principles and Practice, which is used in many universities. He has edited uh, two books, Engineering and Ecosystems, to be published by Springer this year, and the second, Thermodynamics and the Destruction of Resources, that was published by Cambridge University Press in uh, 2011. He has published more than 200 peer review papers, 20 book chapters, has given three, nearly 300 presentations in conferences and universities, companies, government agencies. And he has taught for many years at MIT very successful short courses on sustainability. He is a member of many editorial boards. And for his work, he has been recognized by many awards. By the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, he has received four awards, all of them in the area of ecology and sustainability. There's no other award to receive. So he has to shift and move into another area or into another professional organization. Today, ah, he received his bachelor's in chemical engineering from the Institute of Chemical Technology in Mumbai, and his master's and PhD from MIT, where he did also a minor in technology and environmental policy with short uh, research stints also at MIT at Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government. Today, he's going to talk to us about reinventing the chemicals and materials industry for a net zero, nature positive world. Babek. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for the very nice uh, introduction there. And thanks to all of you for uh, participating, those of you in person, very nice to see you in person. And uh, those of you virtually, you know, hopefully uh, the technology will uh, cooperate. Um, uh, you know, and uh, this uh, slides, you'll be able to see them. And uh, 
uh, you know, hear the presentation and also participate uh, through questions and other means of interaction. So as George said, you know, I'm going to be uh, describing some of the work in the next roughly uh, 40 minutes or so uh, about, uh, you know, essentially reinventing the chemicals and materials industry. And uh, the goal is to get to net zero in terms of emissions and also nature positive. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that, you know, as we go along. Okay. So uh, I don't think I need to convince anybody that the chemicals and materials industry has played a very big role in our well-being. So here is a list of the top 10 chemical engineering innovations that the Institution of Chemical Engineers in the United Kingdom came up with you know, a few years ago. I'm not going to go through this. There are the usual suspects in here. Important to point out vaccines, uh, you know, plastics, fertilizer, uh, you know, drinking water, et cetera. From an economic point of view, the chemical industry contributes $5.7 trillion to the global GDP, supports 120 million jobs, uh, and uh, directly uh, it contributes 1.1 trillion and uh, you know, 15 uh, million jobs. 120 million is direct and indirect. Mm -hmm. So it's a big uh, player, uh, needless to say. So CMI, the chemicals and materials industry, is essential for our well-being. However, negative side, uh, which is that it does have a large impact on environmental as well as societal aspects. To summarize, uh, summarize some of that, if we focus specifically on greenhouse gas uh, emissions, oh, it's not visible here for some reason. Okay. I'll explain the figure to you, doesn't matter. So there's a pie chart. Imagine over here. <laughs> okay. And what that pie chart shows is the greenhouse gas emissions, direct greenhouse gas emissions across the world from the chemicals and materials industries uh, are approximately 30%. Energy related emissions are about 24%. Process related emissions are about 5%. If you look at other major activities globally, uh, transportation, buildings, agriculture are roughly between 16 and 18%. So CMI, the chemicals and materials industry, have 30% of the global greenhouse gas emissions directly. If you think about the indirect emissions also, so the embodied uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the chemicals and materials industry, that number goes up to approximately 70%. Okay, And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we go on. But you know, the point here is that there is a large impact of the chemicals and materials industry when we Think about greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Another impact that again is probably familiar is that related to plastics. So you know there are plastic islands in the ocean. You know plastics was the medical compound uh, developed over the last uh, you know uh, many decades. And the side effects of that you know every, are probably familiar uh, with everyone. So I'm just going to remind you about that and quickly move on. So what we need uh, is a world that is net zero in terms of emissions and resource use, is nature positive, in other words, rather than uh, you know, uh, causing land use change and destroying uh, uh, ecosystems and biodiversity, we need to be restoring uh, and protecting ecosystems and biodiversity. And we also need a world that is uh, you know, uh, socially equitable. So this diagram, again, maybe some of you may be familiar with it. This is sort of the famous uh, donut economy diagram that Kate uh, Rawer from Oxfam came up with a few years ago. And uh, this, this green ecological ceiling here is the upper limit, uh, essentially nature's carrying capacity. Um, and an earlier paper by Rockstrom and others indicates that, you know, we are exceeding nature's capacity for climate change, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, biodiversity loss, and land conversion. And the, the inner uh, limit uh, here is the social foundation, which is the minimum amount of ecosystem goods and services that are needed for uh, human well-being and from an equity uh, perspective in particular. So when it comes to the social foundation, there are many parts of the world where issues like availability of uh, gender equity, social equity, uh, uh, you know, income and work, uh, availability of clean water, adequate food, health, you know, these numbers that are going inside indicate that there are inequities in those categories across the world. So what has been recognized is that humanity needs to learn to operate in this light green area, what has been called the donut economy, 
Um, and achieving net zero, nature positive and equitable are essential and important ways of trying to achieve uh, this overall uh, goal. When we talk of net zero, uh, especially from a greenhouse gases point of view, as you may know, there are lots of pledges that have been made. Here are just some uh, screenshots of uh, newspaper headlines. This is literally a newspaper headline. I still subscribe to the paper version of the New York Times. Um, so this is from January 19, 2022. It's on uh, sets a climate goal of net zero in 28 years. And uh, this is a, you know, another similar headline. About 200 companies, more than 200 companies, have pledged to become net zero Okay, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. As we know, uh, by 2040, some are even saying 2030, and so on. So this is great, right? This is how we can probably get to net zero. Uh, you know, the political and the policy approaches for getting to this, uh, you know, probably the less said the better, but at least the corporate approach, you know, is moving in the right direction. That's great, I think. But they seem to be falling short. Okay, there are other studies that have come out in the last few months. There is a headline from uh, CNN, which says some of the world's biggest companies are, are basically failing in their climate pledges. And this uh, study, uh, The rest of the slides are not showing. Is it showing on that screen? No, oh, it's not. Um, is there any way I can connect my computer? Sorry for that. These uh, technical difficulties in, in uh, the world we live in today are not exactly uncommon. So I've done lectures, you know, without <clears throat> slides. <laughs> so I can certainly, you know, um, do that over here. You know, it will be less visual, but. Uh, Okay, all right. So uh, just bear with uh, us for a few more seconds and this should work. So if you can make it page, I think the page view. Just this room. Uh, Acrobat is not showing working. Yeah, it's acrobat. Oh. This is working. Okay. Control L. Oh, okay, like that's, that's working. Again. All right. The previous pie chart showed up. Yeah, it showed up exactly. So it's working now. Okay, so this is the pie chart that I was <laughs> referring to. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Okay, all right. So here is the uh, the uh, the graph, the key diagram from that study about uh, you know net zero pledges uh, not being met. So they they focused on the twenty five biggest companies out there. And essentially, this is the amount that they have pledged to reduce you know, by 2040. But if you look at the actual numbers and I look at actually what they're doing, you can see that they're barely going to be meeting 20% of their suggested, of their you know, said pledge. There's a large amount that could be met. These are you know, scope three supply chain related emissions that they're not really focusing on, they could. And then this last amount about 0.7 gigatons out of about 2.7. 
uh, is you know not very clear as to what is you know going to be done with those. So they are falling short. Uh, it seems. Um, is quicker. Yeah. Uh, so you know if we and this is only focusing on net zero, right? You know, gas emissions, which is getting a lot of publicity, a lot of effort. If you focus on biodiversity loss and going to this net nature positive target, situation is even worse. So the motivation, therefore, and the goal of the work uh, that I've been doing in my group for the last, you know, I guess, couple of decades now, is for the chemicals and materials industry to enable sustainable development. Basically, small adjustment, you know, of the current paradigm is not going to be enough. Okay, if we just were going to, you know, yeah, even put solar panels everywhere, that's not really practically, you know, possible anymore. You know, the projections are that even, you know, by 2050, we will be using 50% or so of fossil resources. So just small tweaks in the current paradigm is not quite going to cut it. I, I will uh, try to convince you as we go through that the chemicals and materials industry for real change needs to be reinvented to a circular enterprise. And thirdly, the engineering paradigm, which has traditionally for the last two or three, well, three centuries taken nature for granted, assumed it to be an infinite source and sink, needs to shift so that it explicitly accounts for the role of nature and takes into account its limits and you know, prioritizes respecting those limits. So what we've been doing, and I'll give you a glimpse of this in the next several slides, is to develop systematic methods and tools to transform engineering so that its contributions are ecologically viable, economically feasible, socially desirable for current as well as future generations. Okay, so broadly, this slide, I'm just gonna give you a broad overview of the various areas that we are working in and then focus on primarily two of them. So one area that we're working in is broadly this area, this way of thinking about mimicking ecological systems, so eco-mimicry. Idea is to learn from and emulate nature. The idea of coming to a net zero economy or, or, or system, a or circular economy for materials and products in many ways is mimicking the biogeochemical cycles in ecological uh, systems. The idea of uh, seeking synergies between uh, uh, engineering activities or human activities more broadly, if you like, uh, and ecological systems is the second area that we are working on. Um, and here, you know, we would encourage nature positive decisions uh, that would protect and restore ecosystems. We're working also on uh, methods by which we can transition to sustainability. So if you have a goal of becoming sustainable or net zero by 2040, how are you going to get there? What are the steps you need to adopt for that? You know, in what order? How do you take into account the development of new technologies? How do you take into account the probably the grid becoming cleaner? and potentially even the changing climate over you know, that kind of a time period. So that's the third area that we're working on. Uh, so these three I'm gonna give you a glimpse of in the next several slides. I'm, I'm gonna probably skip a few slides in the interest of time uh, so that we still get done uh, in an hour. And there is still at least you know, a little bit of time for questions uh, at the end. Uh, we're also working on incorporating this idea of a safe uh, uh, operating space for humanity that I showed you in that donut diagram. And social justice uh, parts. This work is very much in progress. I'm not going to really share any results, but if you're interested, I can provide you more details of what, you know, the approach that we are taking over there. There is a theoretical framework behind all of the work that we do that is a multi-scale framework for sustainable engineering. And what that framework does is integrate so all the way down from the molecular level to the planetary scales, and which is easier said than done. Uh, but this is eventually the kind of theoretical framework you know, that I think is, is needed for addressing you know, these challenges in a systematic and rigorous standard. And lastly, there are educational activities uh, you know, that again, I'm not gonna get into, but George alluded to some of them, you know, books, courses, uh, teaching, et cetera. Okay, so specifically focusing on net zero uh, in the chemicals and materials industry. This is a busy slide, so let me just go through this. This is the general set of steps and the kinds of inputs that we are relying on for you know, uh, developing these methods that will help us get to net zero. So the first thing is we need to know what, where, you know, we need to know where we are, right? So we model the current system, okay? Uh, and for that, we, are, we rely on engineering models, these process models, we have cost data, material flows, et cetera. Then we look at the available alternatives. What are the alternatives that are available now? Okay, and again, uh, various, uh, uh, models and methods go into it and various sources of data get into that. Then we 
multi objective optimization methods uh, primarily, but decision analysis and decision uh, methods to identify the quote unquote best pathways for meeting our goals. Okay, maybe net zero, maybe nature positive. If we meet our goal, you know, then we need to develop, okay, so, you know, I mean, it is possible to meet the goal, now we need to come up with a timeline. So we focus on developing the roadmap. If we don't, which is more likely going to be the case uh, because these goals are not easy to meet, is we, uh, you know, have a method by which we can identify hotspots, you know, where are the biggest impacts coming from, uh, and then identify potential innovations that may not even be developed yet, but that theoretically at least are possible, and other innovations that may be uh, uh, you know, at early stages of their uh, development. So uh, things like accounting for the technology readiness level becomes important. Um, you know, and we, uh, for developing the roadmaps, we used integrated assessment models in there and uh, Markov chain kind of models to capture the evolution and the development of uh, uh, technologies. Now, the, this is the work that is very much in progress. I don't have a case study or an example where I can show you all of these things, not yet at least. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to basically provide you glimpses of each one of these steps. But they're going to be a little bit disjointed. For the first two steps, I'm going to focus on the chemical and materials industry broadly. But for the rest of it, I'm going to focus only on plastics and specifically one product, which is grocery bags. Okay, uh, because that's what we have. There's plenty of work that still needs to be done. Hopefully, it'll give you an idea of you know, the potential of this and you know, the future work that uh, is, you know, uh, in progress at this point. So we have modeled the current global system with respect to the chemical industry. This is the global chemical industry, and it is only the carbon flow as of 2018, okay? Uh, the blue lines uh, are the flows that are actually going to materials. These are all materials. And the uh, yellow lines or the light yellow lines are going to the environment, primarily CO2. So if you do a carbon efficiency calculation for the global chemical and materials industry, actually, this is only the chemical industry. We have not included cement and iron and steel here, uh, just to make this uh, diagram a little bit uh, you know, uh, less busy, uh, although it is still very busy. Carbon efficiency turns out to be approximately 42%. In other words, 58% of the carbon that is coming in is leaving primarily as greenhouse gases. And this is a global carbon uh, or chemical industry uh, snapshot. Now, so that's basically the first step. And we have these kinds of models, we're developing them for specific industries. So you could focus on a specific product, maybe bottles, and there is a sub model that is already in here. You could focus on, you know, acetone, and there is a sub model that is in here. There are versions of this that we are in the process of developing that are tailored to countries and even to companies. Okay, this is very much work in, in progress at this point but we have the framework by which to develop this. So we know the current system, then we need to model the alternatives. There are broadly three categories of alternatives you know, that we can use for uh, getting to net zero with respect to greenhouse gases. There are alternatives on the input side, things like renewable energy, green hydrogen, green methane, biorefineries so biomass-based approaches and so on. There are methods on the output side, uh, and I have Klaus here, Okay, who knows uh, you know, much more about this than, than I do, but carbon capture related, including direct air capture. But there are other methods also for carbon capture, uh, utilization, conversion, uh, and storage. And there are nature-based solutions, planting trees, I guess, right? And soil management. Importantly, there is also uh, there are also alternatives that are in the circular economy. So by circularizing the chemical industry, it should be possible to reduce you know, emissions of greenhouse gases, as I will show or discuss in more detail on the next slide. So, uh, taken, uh, you know, from uh, uh, a report called the Circularity Gap Report, and it shows embodied. I'm sure you can't read all the text on it. So let me just explain some of the key characteristics here. The total amount of carbon that is going into the uh, economy, uh, you know, includes fossil fuels, minerals, ores, Biomass and waste. There are there is carbon embodied in all of these. It's about fifty nine point one gigatons globally. The blue 
uh, lines indicate the carbon that is present in the form of energy, in the form of fuels. Okay, so you can see that this there is a lot of carbon that is in the form of, of fuels. Okay, um, and that goes through, and eventually we end up with you know the red is various uh, transportation uh, products, and all these other colors are industrial products. Okay, notice that there is a lot of blue here, but as we go on, the amount of blue decreases, and the other colors increase, meaning that you know the carbon that is being used over here is essentially getting embodied, if you like, in the other products that are being made. Okay, so um, if we look at the amount of carbon at this step, you know, where we have these different basic processes, the direct energy use is about 70%. So this blue is approximately 70% of all the uh, flows that you see over here, okay? If you go to the production stage, it becomes approximately 50, 50, 50. So blue now is less, approximately 50%. Rest of the carbon is embodied in materials. And finally, when you get to the products which meet societal needs, 70% of the carbon is embodied in the materials. So if we were to circularize these materials, the materials economy, then what we could potentially reduce the use of uh, fossil resources that are coming you know, from the environment and uh, you know, enable uh, the use of the products you know, again through things like potentially chemical recycling. Okay, so the polyethylene, we convert it back to ethylene and the ethylene then can go back to polyethylene. The technology for this is an active area of research, including people uh, over here at Arizona State. And that it is estimated can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 42%, okay? Because of the large amount of carbon that is embodied in the material. So 42% of carbon, it is estimated, we can reduce just by having a circular economy. For the rest of it, we will need to probably do some uh, carbon capture, utilization and storage, and uh, switch over to non-fossil resources. So I've talked about mainly these two steps so far. Now get to the next of them. How do we identify the best pathways? And what I'm going to do now, as I indicated earlier, is I'm going to, I'm going to switch to a simpler case study, okay, a simpler example, which is going to be based on grocery sacks. Okay. So for grocery sacks, in principle, the problem is very similar. We have a large network, as you can see on this diagram. Uh, and you know we are making we are considering these five types of grocery bags: high density polyethylene, low density polyethylene, polypropylene, polylactic acid, and paper. The green ones, PLA and paper, are biodegradable. Okay, and they're made from biomass. High density polyethylene is single use. Low density polyethylene and polypropylene, the ones we are considering, are thicker bags. They can be reused approximately ten times. Now, to make those bags, obviously, there is a lot of uh, activity needed in the upstream life cycle, including extraction of the resources, growing of the biomass, etc. Uh, the bags get used by households. Households, you know, depending on their preferences and their behavior, there may be some losses to the environment due to littering. Uh, the bags, you know, would eventually end up in a materials recovery facility. Uh, there is landfilling, pyrolysis, incineration, composting. These are all options that are available that we have uh, considered. For recycling, you could convert the bags into plastic lumber, cement clinker, or do uh, you know, other types of recycling that is generally included in this box. So, the, so each step here has many different alternatives. There are, if you do the math here, it comes to around 120 or so different alternatives that are possible by combinations of alternatives that are available at each of the nodes. So, each combination of alternatives, each pathway effectively, is going to have a different degree of circularity, is going to have a different life cycle impact, and I'm only going to focus on uh, carbon footprint over here, and it is going to have a different cost. So which pathway is best is the question that we would like to be able to answer. And secondly, if we don't find a pathway that we like, how do we improve that pathway? How do we innovate for circularity? So this is an optimization problem that it ends up, and I'm not going to get into details of this, except to say we have an objective function. Typically, we have in this case, we have three objective functions, uh, cost, circularity, and carbon footprint. And there are a bunch of constraints. There are life cycle models that go in to, take, to calculate the carbon footprint. There are 
consumer preferences that go in. And then there is the physics and chemistry of the processes that are uh, available as alternatives. The type of result we get is summarized uh, on this slide. So you can see we have a uh, circularity index over here, carbon footprint over here, and cost over here. And there is no single solution that is going to be best and is going to you know, uh, uh, have high circularity, low global warming potential, and low cost. Okay, No such solution exists for the bags that we have considered uh, in this uh, particular study. If you want to have the cheapest solution, the best one okay, is basically to use low density polyethylene bags. These are bags can be reused roughly 10 times and just throw them all away. They just get littered. You literally throw them out of the window. Okay, from a cost point of view, that is the cheapest thing to do as it turns out for this particular set of, uh, you know, uh, uh, alternatives that we are considering. Recycling costs money. Okay, so here it's like, don't even bother to recycle, just dump them, litter. Okay, now obviously nobody wants to do this and it's not the right solution, but just to give you an idea of the challenges that we face. If you want the smallest global warming potential, smallest carbon footprint, the best solution is to use low density polyethylene bags but there is only so much recycling that can be done, this pink box, okay? Because of technological constraints, right? There is only so much recycling that can be done and certain amount of losses that just happen, you know, in the system that we have currently. If you want higher circularity, high density polyethylene bags uh, seem to make the most sense. But again, the level of circularity is only about 40%. Okay, so getting to a circular economy with any of the options that are available today is not really possible. Okay, especially if you want to do it with a low cost and low carbon footprint, forget it. Okay, there is no good answer. It's that we have considered. So what is to be done? Well, identify opportunities for improvement. So without getting into the method methodological details, we can identify hotspots from the results that I showed you on the previous slide. And if you want to reduce the leakage of plastic into the environment, the key hotspots, the key activities where the losses are mainly happening are the sorting stage from the households, uh, from the collection and from the recycling. I mean, that basically covers you know, all of these. We can also find hotspots for reducing the carbon footprint and you can see power generation, incineration, use of natural gas and transportation are the dominant hotspots over there. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to focus on these hotspots. And uh, for this particular study, this is a collaboration uh, with uh, uh, you know, the Global Kaiteki Center right here at Arizona State. And uh, with data that was collected you know, by our ASU collaborators, George Safropoulos, George Basil, uh, and Kevin Dooley, uh, you know, uh, they gave us data about these innovations that are being done. So for sorting, the, one of the innovations was robotic segregation. For collection, source segregation, recycling, pyrolysis, and chemical uh, chemical recycling of polylactic acid. Those were the alternatives for which we had data. So those are the ones that we consider. So these are all at different levels, different stages of development. Robotic segregation is at TRL3, which means it's at a very early stage of, it's almost like research stage. Okay. Uh, source segregation is at TRL9, which means it's almost close to being practically useful. So, um, uh, so basically we need to take into account these TRL levels of the technologies, which I will talk about, not the next slide, but the one after that. So we identify hotspots, we come up with alternatives that are available. But another way of identifying opportunities for improvement is to go down to the level of the chemistry. Okay. So, you know, we are trying to do uh, recycling of these materials. There is a lot of chemistry information that is available. We know the potential reactions that could take place to enable maybe chemical recycling. So in this example, this is mainly for illustrative purposes, but we have a reaction network. This kind of information is available from chemistry uh, databases. We're collaborating with chemists uh, and chemical engineers at Penn State uh, University for this work. Uh, you know, and we, we know the chemistry, uh, the access database is one of the ones that we are using over here, if you're familiar with that. And we have a framework, a multi-scale framework by which we can connect this chemistry level information, which is essentially a matrix model, a linear algebra model with the model of the life cycle, and we even connect it with economic input output models, you know, just to get an idea of the wider economy scale implications of this. And there is an optimization problem uh, involved over here, and again, we can find the best pathways, the pathways that look most promising, and those may be the ones where, you know, innovation could be uh, concentrated. 
this is work in progress, so I don't have too many specific results to show yet. So once we get to the, uh, you know, I mean, let's say that we have found, you know, the innovations, evaluated them, and we now want to come up with how do we get to net zero? How do we develop the roadmap? Basically, another optimization problem, I'm going to skip this. What we come up with is, uh, this is a, uh, also very much work in progress, is uh, an approach where, so remember, I talked about source segregation, pyrolysis, recyclable PLA, and robotic segregation as those four alternatives, right? Uh, for the grocery stocks. These are all at different technology readiness levels. Ro uh, robotic segregation is very early stage, right? PRL3, research and development. So segregation is at the stage of diffusion and adoption in the marketplace. So what the optimization algorithm will try and do is it will try to minimize the present value of the cost of adopting the innovations or of developing the innovations. There are constraints of carbon neutrality that we need to meet and so on. Uh, we use a continuous time Markov chain model to uh, capture the evolution of technology over time. And there is an integrated assessment model that accounts for the dynamics of background changes, things like the electricity grid becoming cleaner over time and so on. So with that level of a formulation, what we can come up with is maybe we'll um, identify that recyclable PLA is the one that is most promising and worth investing and commercializing you know, at this early stage. And we go on and uh, you know, uh, that they develop and the blue line indicates that it actually gets accepted and gets adopted. Some other technologies, you know, uh, maybe we will decide to defund them or, you know, or it requires more resources uh, to further uh, improve. So this is work that we are developing and eventually, uh, you know, we are hoping that, uh, you know, uh, 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 this met methodology will become of the type that will become, you know, uh, useful for the corporations that are making all these net zero pledges so that they can actually deliver the pledges that they are making, uh, you know, uh, what is needed are methods, tools, and software, okay, to make, uh, you know, those pledges a uh, reality. We have applied this kind of a framework to developing a roadmap for the Ohio State University campus to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Busy set of slides, I'm not gonna go through these graphs, except to point out just one plot. This is over time, 2020 to 20. 70 goal is to become neutral by 2050 and you can see you know the basically use of the grid is going down that's this uh, purple line we have a combined heat and power plant that is coming online and you know few changes happening emissions are going down eventually 2050 the emissions go down to zero but notice that the reason the emissions go down to zero is because you're purchasing um you know almost 200,000 uh tons of carbon dioxide equivalents in terms of offsets which probably is not the best way of doing this. So we can put in other constraints and, uh, and so on, but we have developed a, a tool by which you can you know, do this kind of road mapping, at least for you know, campus uh, types of uh, situations. Okay, so let me now spend a little bit of time, maybe five minutes or so on the nature positive part. And I'm gonna skip through some of the slides uh, as I go through this uh, to try and uh, you know, stay on time. Uh, so the idea here is that industrial systems have various emissions and they need resources. Ecosystems are able to take them up, right? So trees can take up CO2, NO2, NOx, particulate matter, and so on. Also provide other services like provisioning of water, formation of soil, recreational opportunities, and so on. So what we want to do is to take into account these potential for synergistic relationships between technological and ecological systems. So the idea is sort of you know, conveyed broadly by this diagram, where we have a bunch of technological systems. Traditionally, we want to improve the efficiency of this. That's what engineering has been all about. But more recently, there is focus on you know, industrial symbiosis, where we want to keep the waste in the system, and on circular economy, where we want to keep the products within the economy. What we are doing is explicitly including also the role of the ecological systems. Okay? Uh, so you know, they can uh, take waste, convert it, make natural resources, and support various activities. Eventually, hopefully, we get to a more of a self-sustaining system that has, you know, industrial symbiosis, circular economy, and techno-ecological synergy. All of that, you know, collectively. We've applied this idea to many examples. I am not going to get into details of any of them, but here is a 
list, you know, biodiesel manufacturing, management of biosolids, uh, agricultural landscape design. Uh, we have also looked at, you know, design, uh, design of a single family house and its yard. We have also included, uh, you know, ecosystem services in life cycle system. In general, what we find is that if this is the trade-off curve of environmental impact versus cost, if you include ecosystems, you can expand the design space. You get new innovative solutions. Some of them may be win-win, okay? Uh, that become available because you are also now including ecosystems, you know, into your design method. So this opens up room for, you know, innovation that you would never be able to find if you take a traditional engineering technocentric approach. So let me show you an example, and then I will stop over there. So in this example, this is a fairly complicated example. We're taking into account nature's intermittency. Not fixed, right? Someday over here, the sun seems to shine every day. But in Ohio, it doesn't. We even here, yesterday it was cloudy, I think, right? You know, so there is that intermittency. Here we're looking at air pollution, uptake capacity of vegetation. Okay, this is in the Galveston, Texas area. So there are a lot of issues with ground level ozone formation. We're considering a chlor alkali facility over there. There is a coal-fired power plant. This is an electrolytic process, so that's providing electricity. This is the technological solution for removing the NOx from the emissions. This is a selective catalytic reduction unit, which is a standard technology for removing nitrogen oxide emissions. We are also considering the possibility of relying on trees to take up the NOx emissions. And what we are doing is we want to minimize the cost of production or cost to the company, and we want to minimize the cost to society. Society pays a cost because they have to deal with the emissions. And to quantify the impact on society, we are using EPA's Benmap uh, tool, which quantifies social health impact. The decision variables are the size of the technology, the SCR, the area of reforestation, and the rate at which we produce the chlorine. Bunch of constraints, air quality, we are, there are vegetation growth dynamics models in here. There is a model of the chemical process. And this graph over here shows you how the dry deposition on trees varies at an hourly scale through the year. And you can see it jumps around quite a lot. And there is a seasonal aspect here. In the winter, there are less leaves. This is Texas, there are some leaves, but you know, it doesn't have that much capacity to take up uh, emissions. Uh, uh, yeah. So essentially what we find is if this is the cost of production, cost to company, and this is the cost to society, if you use only technology, you get a trade-off curve that looks like this. Point A is the one that has minimum cost of production. To achieve this minimum cost of production, this is the way you manufacture your glory. You, you don't operate in a single operation rate. The traditional approach would be to stay at this black dashed line. That's the, you know, typically processes will get controlled to make sure you get the same amount of glory produced consistently. But if you want to meet these air quality requirements, we have to jump around. And there are days that are shown in these red circles where we have to shut down the plant because air quality is so bad. Mm -hmm. This is with only technology as, a, as an approach. Shutdown of 51 days, annualized production cost is 923,000, health impact cost is 1.4 million. If we were to now include ecosystems, we get a different Pareto curve. Okay, and this point B, which is minimum cost again, um, that is the kind of result we get. Okay, again, lot of intermittency, but notice we shut down only for 38 days, not 51. The cost to the company is $903,000, not $923,000. It goes down, it becomes cheaper for the company because the CR is expensive to them. And societal cost also goes down from 1.4 million to 1.2 million, potentially a win win solution. Okay. What we're essentially doing is if we even have more trees available, the trees could take up pollution from other activities and get to a net positive impact type of manufacturing, which would be you know, good for the company and good for society. Or from the corporate profitability point of view, not necessarily from the societal point of view. You know, uh, trying to be nature positive, I think there are unique opportunities that are present. Over there. This is something that uh, has been recognized, and this is from a World Economic Forum report, that there are $10 trillion worth of business opportunities, 395 million uh, job opportunities, and various companies are actually trying to push in this direction. Okay, so to conclude then, sorry for being a little bit fast here, 
we do need solutions urgently for addressing the challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, social inequities, etc. Chemical and materials industry is essential for human well-being, but it also is the source of environmental and social damage. A lot of efforts are being pursued toward net zero and nature positive world, but they are way too slow right now. Okay, and we one thing we don't seem to have a lot of is time. Okay, um, and it seems like small tweaks in the existing system are not going to be enough to get to meeting this net zero and nature positive kind of goals. What is needed, if we need real progress, we need to reinvent the chemical and materials industry, and we need to shift the engineering paradigm. Reinvention requires focusing on the chemical and materials industry towards more of a circular enterprise. And nature positive means that we explicitly need to account for nature okay, in what we do and respect its limits in our designs and in our operation. Obviously, for all of these, we need systematic methods and tools. Okay, and plenty of challenges that come from economics, policy, and so on that are very relevant, and they also need to be incorporated um, in the approach. A whole bunch of grad students to thank, in particular, Michael Charles, uh, Uttar Shah, Guillaume Thakkar, and Vivek Bhatiam. They are, the, they are the results I showed on the previous slides. Uh, three of these four have already graduated, working for various companies ranging from uh, Tesla to Amazon. Various collaborators at ASU and OSU and financial support. You know, you can see the uh, uh, agencies over there. And if you want more information, uh, there are some details available on this slide. And I'm happy to answer questions now, but also later on in case we run out of time. So thank you for your attention and uh, open for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Bavik. Uh, can the people on Zoom uh, hear me? I think so, yeah. Excellent. Uh, now, uh, the period for questions and answers is open. Any questions from the participants in the room? Online, of course, from the Zoom. one instead of trees i could use louses ducks yeah yeah they wouldn't be as interpreted though Klaus, would that well, be a fair statement or maybe they would that's probably true they are less but don't kid yourself any direct air capture right. device is susceptible to weather right uh, they either pick up water or they lose water the temperature makes a big difference and Plus, wind speed also plays a role, but actually a fairly small one. Right. So overall, yes, you could, but I'm, I'm actually interested in the question. You sort of look at Markov chains and yeah. ERL levels. Right. Isn't the combinatorics just daunting that you have so many different options? And, yeah. and if you change probabilities a little, it moves all over the map. Yeah, they are. And uh, you know, one of the reasons I don't have results here is because this is very much work in progress. If you have some other better way of uh, modeling the evolution of technology, I'm all yours. Well, you know? one, one thing which occurred to me, yeah. rather than saying this is what's going to work, mm -hmm. out the large universe of things which definitely cannot. Okay. That may actually be more powerful because you can say no matter what the combinatorics says, right, I right. can't go there. Right. Well, yeah. this is going to be a horrible answer if, right. if you go yeah. there. Whereas to yeah. say one is 10% better than the other may all it be take to have one win over the other, <clears throat> but you can't possibly predict that. Yeah. So what you're saying is we can come up with the bounding conditions, the ones that yes. you know are just not to be messed with. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, there is another approach that we are exploring, uh, you know, what is called developing a viability space or a viability kernel, yeah. right, which is very much which along, is very much what I just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah very much along uh, those lines. So, you know, I mean, right, right now we're exploring both of those approaches, you know, but the relatively small problem with the four technological options, the Markov chain approach actually is working. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, the key challenge is to figure out the transition probabilities, etc. But that, you know, I mean, that can be done. Uh, so right now we're looking at, at both of them. Uh, you know, the, the other thing we're doing is we're also taking the scenario-based approach. Maybe we are considering this idea of, of uh, shared socioeconomic pathways. 
where you look at longer term you know scenarios uh, and I, I there are some results but I haven't you know shared them but that's also another approach that we are exploring you know for uh, enabling this road mapping yes. activity yeah I think that, that that actually is important and shell actually in the in the 1970s made got a huge impact by using narrative scenarios and pointing out that <laughs> somewhere around right. the time we had an oil crisis, Right. Things just wouldn't work, no matter how you looked at it. Right, right. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, we are considering, you know, we are using integrated ass assessment models. Image is one of the ones that we're exploring right now, you know, for doing, uh, you know, incorporating that into the results uh, that we get. Very interesting. A series of questions. I think, I think uh, do we have uh, another question from the room? Yeah, yes, I, please. I was curious some other um, examples of areas where there's potential for techno-ecological synergy because the air quality example, you know, a lot of people, and I'm one of them, have criticized iTree for right. badly overestimating dry deposition rates, but, you know, there's there's all kinds of possible techno-ecological synergies. Are you working on some other examples? Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, the one I showed you is the one that is most dynamic and computationally at least the most challenging. Right, and I tree, I, I know what you're talking about, right? I mean, uh, you know, there are issues with the quality of the models and so on. But, you know, our approach, our, our objective was more to explore, develop the method that could allow, you know, us to deal with this kind of dynamic. So there's a lot of control theory behind all this, which again, I've not gotten into. Uh, it ends up being actually an integrated design and control problem, which is quite a difficult class of problems, you know, uh, to, to solve. Nevertheless, getting to your question about other techno-ecological synergies. So uh, other ones that we have considered, you know, have to do with uh, say design of, of agricultural landscapes. Okay. So, you know, if you have a plot of land, uh, you know, this was something that DOE had a few years ago and you have a plot of land, what is the best way of using that land uh, for getting renewable energy, food, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, addressing or staying within the limits of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and water quality. So there we took very much of this kind of an approach where we would convert part of the land, you know, uh, by growing trees, put uh, buffer strips, wetlands for managing the water and so on. Uh, We've also looked at another, another option, uh, looking at the food, energy, water, carbon dioxide and cost nexus uh, of managing a watershed. So we've looked at the Muskingum River watershed in Ohio. Uh, using a SWOT model uh, for that. And we have considered, you know, the presence of various types of uh, 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 ways of generating electricity. Okay, traditionally, the natural gas burning, you know, power plants over there, uh, you know, uh, carbon capture and conversion technologies over there. We, you know, we are using monoethanol amine and converting the CO2 to, I believe, formic acid. Um, and we are also looking at ecological solutions, changing the land use, you know, uh, getting more carbon to get sequestered by the soil and so on. We are also considering over there solar energy and specifically um, the use of solar uh, or solar panels with uh, with um, uh, 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 crops growing underneath, right? Uh, the agri voltaics idea, okay? And we get some really interesting results over there, okay? That paper is also published, uh, you know, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, uh, and I'm happy to provide you, you know, with with uh, you know more details about that. So there are several applications of this type that we have you know done so far but i think there's a lot more to do before we can get to the point where we can actually maybe implement some of these things that's ultimately what i hope we can get to you know uh, and i mean that's a fun problem to be thinking about and hopefully it will be something of practical relevance also great thank you so, babek i have uh, uh, the following question which i think uh, it has been repeated by a couple of people in similar spirit. For your systematic framework, the assessment is very technology centric. Okay. Factor in the social context yeah. of what is being acceptable in different social right. contents. Right. Here at ASU, the Global <laughs> Futures Laboratory, we have a decision theater framework uh, where these issues can be debated. How should such a framework be useful? Well, uh, very valid question, no doubt. Uh, you know, the social aspects, we have not brought them in 
to this because we have basically solved the problem that we are more comfortable solving and is an easier problem to be honest, right? The way to bring in the social aspects is I think, you know, I, I don't have that expertise, right? I don't have the social science background. I think what is needed is to collaborate with social scientists and, you know, bring that connection into this picture. I think, I mean, the framework, I'm quite confident, can incorporate, you know, other considerations, you know, uh, uh, social acceptability issues, you know, policy issues, et cetera, can be incorpor incorporated, you know, in, in the framework. But the way to do it is to collaborate with social scientists. Maybe there are people here that I could collaborate with, then maybe you would use the decision theater kind of an approach. But that's a great question. It's a question that uh, needs more work. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, I have another question related uh, to education. Okay. Thank you for an excellent seminar. Based on your experience, what would you say are the main educational challenges you see in this field right. uh, for, first of all, a chemical engineer or engineers in general, okay. yeah. and secondly, non-engineers with a significant interest in the problem space, but limited mathematical skills? Right. Okay. So for the engineers, that's the easier question to answer because a lot of my teaching of the sustainable engineering course and so on has been mainly to engineers, chemical, but also other flavors. You know, engineers have an attitude which is very technocentric. And I guess that's not surprising, right? You know, uh, the attitude tends to be is like, oh, we'll develop the technology and solve the problem. Uh, the realization or the understanding or the appreciation of the importance of ecosystems and how we truly depend on them for sustainability is relatively weak most of the times. You know, uh, there are surveys uh, that others have done that show that in terms of ecological literacy, engineers tend to be among the worst, okay? So I think one of the challenges is for engineers to sort of get over that hubris of, oh, don't worry, I have technology, I'm gonna solve the problem and make them realize that this problem is not the kind that is gonna get solved by any single discipline. It is a very much of a multidisciplinary problem. You need all voices in the room to come in uh, and you know, understanding what ecosystems do and their importance is also very important, is, is essential. For the non-engineers, you know, I mean, again, I think to some extent, this is the kind of project or, or kind of challenge that needs collaborative work, you know, and over here, you know, you have the Global Futures Lab, all the other activities, you know, that enable, that are meant to enable, you know, that kind of collaboration. At the end of the day, you know, that is, I think, very much uh, what is needed. I believe sustainability-related education needs to become a requirement, okay? And I, I don't know about specifically ASU, but at OSU, it is not a requirement. People can easily graduate with a degree in a variety of areas, have, you know, zero uh, understanding or uh, introduction to any of these sustainability uh, types of challenges. There is one thing I would try to push. I would try to bring about that change. Thank you. And uh, this has been debated also at MIT, where the evolving uh, somehow understanding is that uh, ethics right. should be present uh, in the curriculum, not as a separate course necessarily, but as an integral part right. of a student's education through the series of courses. Sustainability could become also yeah. an integrated element throughout the curriculum, not just in one course. Right. This culture is not developed by courses, one course. It's yeah. developed by permeating all the other courses that engineers take. The time has gone over. Yeah. So let's thank uh, Babek at this point for his seminar which was very, very educational to me, despite the fact that I know a lot of it. <laughs> Babek, thank you very much. Thank you.